Anyway, chapter 58. The donkeys were all good, all handsome, all strong and in good condition, all fast and all willing to prove it. They were the best we had found anywhere in the most research. I do not know what research is, but that is what these donkeys were anyhow. Some were of a soft mouse color, and the others are white, black, and very colored. Some were close shaven all over, except that a tuft like a paintbrush was left on the end of the tail. Others were so shaven in fanciful landscape garden patterns as to mark their bodies with curving lines, which were bounded on one side by hair and on the other by the close plush left by the shears. They had all been newly barbered and were exceedingly stylish. Several of the white ones were barred like zebras with rainbow stripes of blue and red and yellow paint. These were indescribably gorgeous. Dan and Jack selected from this lot because they, they brought back Italian reminiscences of the old masters. The saddles were the high, stuffy, frog-shaped things we had known in Ephesus and Smyrna. The donkey boys were lively young Egyptian rascals who could follow a donkey and keep him in a canter half a day without tiring. We had plenty of spectators when we mounted, for the hotel was full of English people bound overland to India and officers getting ready for the African campaign against the Absissian King Theodorus. We were not a very large party, but we charged through the streets of the great metropolis. We made noise for 500 and displayed activity and created excitement in proportion. Nobody can steer a donkey, and some collided with camels, dervishes, effendies, asses, beggars, and everything else that offered to the donkeys a reasonable chance for a collision. When we turned into the broad avenue that leads out of the city towards old Cairo, there was plenty of room. The walls of stately date palms that fenced the gardens and bordered the way threw their shadows down and made the air cool and bracing. We rose to the spirit of the time, and the race became a wild rout, a stampede, a terrific panic. I wish to live to enjoy it again. Somewhere along this route we had a few startling exhibitions of oriental simplicity. A girl, apparently thirteen years of age, came along the great thoroughfare, dressed like Eve before the fall. We would have called her thirteen at home, but here girls who look thirteen are often not more than nine in reality. Occasionally we saw stark naked men of superb build bathing and making no attempt at concealment. However, an hour's acquaintance with this cheerful custom reconciled the pilgrims to it, and then it ceased to occasion remark. Thus easily do even the most startling novelties grow tame and spiritless to these sight-surfeited wanderers. Arrived at old Cairo, the camp followers took up the donkeys and tumbled them bodily aboard a small boat with a lateen sail, and we followed and got under way. The deck was closely packed with donkeys and men, and two sailors had to climb over and under and through the wedged mass to work the sails and the steersman had to crowd four or five donkeys out of the way when he wished to swing his tiller and put his helm down hard. But what were their troubles to us? We had nothing to do, nothing to do but enjoy the trip, nothing to do but shove the donkeys off our corns and look at the charming scenery of the Nile. On the island at our right, was a machine they call the Nilometer, a stone column whose business it was to mark the rise of the river and 
prophecy whether it would reach only 32 feet and produce a famine, or whether it would properly flood the land at 40 and produce plenty, or whether it will rise to 43 and bring death and destruction to flocks and crops. But how it does all this, they could not explain to us, so that we could understand. On the same island is still shown the spot where Pharaoh's daughter found Moses in the bulrushes. Near the spot we sailed from, the Holy Family dwelt when they sojourned in Egypt, till Herod should complete his slaughter of the innocents. The same tree they rested under when they first arrived was there a short time ago, but the Viceroy of Egypt sent it to the Empress Eugenie lately. He was just in time, otherwise our pilgrims would have had it. The Nile at this point is muddy, swift and turbid, and does not lack a great deal of being as wide as the Mississippi. We scrambled up the steep bank at the shabby town of Gazia, mounted the donkeys again, and scampered away. For four or five miles the route lay along a high embankment, which they say is the, to be the bed of a railway the Sultan means to build, for no other reason than, than that when the Empress of the French comes to visit him, she can go to the pyramids in comfort. This is true Oriental hospitality, and I'm very glad it is our privilege to have donkeys instead of cars. At the distance of a few miles, the pyramids rising above the palms looked very clean-cut very grand and imposing, and very soft and filmy as well. They swam in a rich haze that took from them all suggestions of unfeeling stone, and made them seem only the airy nothings of a dream, structures which might blossom into tiers of vague arches or ornate colonnades, maybe and change and change again into all graceful forms of architecture while we looked and then melt deliciously away and blend with a tremulous atmosphere at the end of the levee we left the mules and went in a sailboat across an arm of the nile or an overflow and landed where the sands of the great sahara left their embankment as straight as a wall along the verge of an alluvial plain of the river. A laborious walk in the flaming sun brought us to the foot of the great pyramid of Cheops. It was a fairy vision no longer. It was a corrugated, unsightly mountain of stone. Each of its monstrous sides was a wide stairway which rose upward, step above step, narrowing as it went, till it tapered to a point far aloft in the air. Insect men and women, pilgrims from the Quaker city, were creeping about its dizzying perches, and one little black swarm were waving postage stamps from the airy summit. Handkerchiefs will be understood. Of course, we were besieged by a rabble of muscular Egyptians and Arabs who wanted the contract of dragging us to the top. All tourists are. Of course, you could not hear your own voice for the din that was around you. Of course, the sheikhs said that they were the only responsible parties, that all contracts must be made with them, all monies paid over to them, and none exacted from us by anybody but themselves alone. Of course, they contracted that the varlets who dragged us up should not mention bucksheesh once, for such is the usual routine. Of course, we contracted with them, paid them, were delivered into the hands of the draggers, dragged up the pyramids and harried and bedeviled for bucksheesh from the foundation clear to the summit, 
We paid it, too, for we were purposely spread very far apart over the vast side of the pyramid. There was no help near if we called, and the Herculeses who dragged us had a way of asking sweetly and flatteringly for bucksheesh, which was seductive, and of looking fierce and threatening to throw us down the precipice, which was persuasive and convincing. Each step being full as high as a dinner table, there being very, very many of the steps, an Arab having hold of each of our arms and springing upward from one step to step and snatching us with them, forcing us to lift our feet as high as our breasts each time and do it rapidly and keep it up till we were ready to faint. Who shall say it was not lively? Exhilarating, lacerating, muscle-straining, bone-wrenching, and perfectly excruciating, an exhausting pastime climbing the pyramids. I beseeched the varlets not to twist all my joints asunder. I iterated, reiterated, even swore to them that I did not wish to beat anybody to the top, did all I could to convince them that if I got there the last of all, I would feel blessed above men and grateful to them forever. I begged them, prayed them, pleaded with them to let me stop and rest a moment, only one little moment, and they only answered with some more frightful springs, and an unenlisted volunteer behind opened a bombardment of determined boosts with his head, which threatened to batter my whole political economy to wreck and ruin. Twice for one minute they let me rest while they exhorted bucksheesh, and then continued their manic flight up the pyramid. They wished to beat the other parties. It was nothing to them that I, a stranger, must be sacrificed upon the altar of their unholy ambition. But in the midst of sorrow, joy blooms. Even in this dark hour, I had a sweet consolation, for I knew that except these Mohammedans repented, they would go straight to perdition some day. And they never repent. They never forsake their paganism. This thought calmed me, cheered me, and I sank down limp and exhausted upon the summit, but happy, so happy and serene. On the one hand, a mighty sea of yellow sand stretched away towards the ends of the earth, solemn, silent, shorn of vegetation, its solitude uncheered by any forms of creature life, on the other, the Eden of Egypt was spread below us, a broad green floor cloven by the sinuous river dotted with villages, its vast distances measured and marked by the diminishing stature of receding clusters of palms. It lay asleep in an enchanted atmosphere. There was no sound, no motion, Above the date palms in the middle distance swelled a domed and pinnacled mass, glimmering through a tinted, exquisite mist. Away toward the horizon, a dozen shapely pyramids watched over ruined Memphis, and at our feet the bland, impassable Sphinx looked out upon the picture of her throne in the sands as placidly and pensively as she had looked upon its like full fifty lagging centuries ago. We suffered torture no pen can describe from the hungry appeals for bucksheesh that gleamed from Arab eyes and poured incessantly from Arab lips. Why try to call up the traditions of vanished Egyptian grandeur why try to fancy Egypt following dead Ramses to his tomb in the pyramid? Or the long multitude of Israel departing over the desert yonder? 
Why try to think at all? The thing was impossible. One must bring his meditations cut and dried, or else cut and dry them afterward. The traditional Arab proposed in the traditional way to run down Cheops, cross the eighth of a mile of sand intervening between it and the tall pyramid of Sephron, ascend to Sephron's summit, and return to us on the top of Cheops, all in nine minutes by the watch, and the whole service to be rendered for a single dollar. In the first flush of irritation, I said, let the Arab and his exploits go to the mischief. But stay. The upper third of the saffron was coated with dressed marble, smooth as glass. A blessed thought entered my brain. He must infallibly break his neck. Close the contract with dispatch, I said, and let him go. He started. We watched. He went bounding down the vast broadside, spring after spring, like an ibex. He grew small and smaller till he became a bobbing pygmy away down toward the bottom, then disappeared. We turned and peered over the other side. Forty seconds, eighty seconds, a hundred. Happiness. He is dead already. Two minutes and a quarter. There he goes. Too true. It was too true. He was very small now. Gradually but surely he overcame the level ground. He began to spring and climb again, up, up, up. At last he reached a smooth coating, now for it. But he clung to it with his toes and fingers like a fly. He crawled this way and that, and away to the right, slanting upward, away to the left, still slanting upward, and stood at last, a black peg on the summit, and waved his pygmy scarf. Then he crept downward to the raw steps again, and picked up his agile heels and flew. We lost him presently, but presently again we saw him under us, mounting with undiminished energy. Shortly he bounded into our midst with a gallant war-whoop. Time, eight minutes, forty-one seconds. He had won. His bones were intact. It was a failure, I reflected. I said to myself, he is tired and must grow dizzy. I will risk another dollar on him. He started again, made the trip again, slipped on the smooth coating. I almost had him, but an infamous crevice saved him. He was with us once more, perfectly sound. Time, eight minutes, forty-six seconds. I said to Dan, lend me a dollar. I can beat this game yet. Worse and worse. He won again. Time, eight minutes, forty-eight seconds. I was out of all patience now. I was desperate. Money was no longer of any consequence. I said, Sirrah, I will give you a hundred dollars to jump off this pyramid head first. If you do not like the terms... Name your bet. I scorn to stand on expenses now. I will stay right here and risk money on you as long as Dan has got a cent. I was in a fair way to win now, for it was a dazzling opportunity for an Arab. He pondered a moment, would have done it, I think, but his mother arrived and then and interfered. Her tears moved me. I never can look upon the tears of a woman with indifference, and I said I would give her a hundred to jump off, too. But it was a failure. The Arabs are too high-priced in Egypt. They put on airs unbecoming of such savages. We descended hot and out of humor. The dragoman lit candles, and we all entered a hole near the base of the pyramid attended by a crazy rabble of Arabs who thrust their services upon us uninvited. They dragged us up a long, inclined chute and dripped candle grease all over us. This chute was not more than twice as wide and high as a Saratoga trunk and was walled, roofed, and floored with solid blocks of Egyptian granite, 
as wide as a wardrobe, twice as thick and three times as long. We kept on climbing through the oppressive gloom, till I thought we ought to be nearing the top of the pyramid again, and then came to the queen's chamber, and shortly to the chamber of the king. These large apartments were tombs. The walls were built of monstrous masses of smooth granite, neatly joined together. Some of them were nearly as large as square and square as an ordinary parlor. A great stone sarcophagus with a bathtub stood in the center of the king's chamber. Around it were gathered a picturesque group of Arab savages and soiled and tattered pilgrims who held their candles aloft in the gloom while they chattered, and the winking blurs of light shed a dim glory down upon one of the irrepressible memento-seekers who was pecking at the venerable sarcophagus with his sacrilegious hammer. We struggled out to the open air in the bright sunshine, and for the space of thirty minutes received ragged Arabs by couples, dozens, and platoons, and paid them buckshish for services they swore and threw by each other that they had rendered, but which we had not been aware of before, and as each party was paid, they dropped into the rear of the procession, and in due time arrived again with a newly invented delinquent list for liquidation. We lunched in the shade of the pyramid, and in the midst of this encroaching and unwelcome company, and, and then Dan and Jack and I started away for a walk. A howling swarm of beggars followed us, surrounded us, almost headed us off. A sheik and flowing white burnous and gaudy headgear was with them. He wanted more buckshish. But we had adopted a new code. It was millions for defense, but not a cent for buckshish. I asked him if he could persuade the others to depart if we paid him. He said yes, for ten francs. We accepted the contract and said, Now persuade your vassals to fall back. He swung his long staff around his head, and three Arabs bit the dust. He capered along the mob like a very maniac. His blows fell like hail, and wherever one fell, a subject went down, and we had to hurry to the rescue and tell him it was only necessary to damage them a little. He need not kill them. In two minutes, we were alone with the sheik and remained so. The persuasive powers of this illiterate savage were remarkable. Each side of the Pyramid of Cheops is about as long as the capital at Washington or the Sultan's new palace on the Bosphorus, and is longer than the greatest depth of St. Peter's at Rome, which is to say that each side of Cheops extends seven hundred and some odd feet. It is about seventy-five feet higher than the cross on St. Peter's, the first time I ever went down to Mississippi, I thought the highest bluff on the river between St. Louis and New Orleans, it was near Selma, Missouri, was probably the highest mountain in the world. It was 413 feet high. It still looms in my memory with undiminished grandeur. I can still see the trees and bushes growing smaller and smaller as I follow them up its huge slant with my eye till they became a feathery fringe on a distant summit. This symmetrical pyramid of Cheops, this solid mountain of stone reared by the patient hands of men, this mighty tomb of a forgotten monarch, dwarfs my cherished mountain, for it is 480 feet high. In still earlier years than those I have been recalling, Holiday's Hill in our town was to me the noblest work of God. It appeared to pierce the skies. It was nearly three hundred feet high. In those days I pondered the subject much, but I 
never could understand why it did not swathe its summit with the never-failing clouds and crowned its majestic brow with everlasting snows. I had heard that such was the custom of great mountains in other parts of the world. I remembered how I worked with another boy at odd afternoons, stolen from study and paid for with stripes, to undermine and start from its bed an immense boulder that rested upon the edge of that hilltop. I remembered how, one Saturday afternoon, we gave three hours of honest effort to the task and saw at last that our reward was at hand. I remember how we sat down then and wiped the perspiration away and waited to let a picnic party get out of the way in the road below. Then we started the boulder. It was splendid. It went crashing down the hillside, tearing up saplings, mowing bushes down like grass, ripping and crushing and smashing everything in its path. Eternally splintered and scattered a woodpile at the foot of the hill, then sprang from the high bank clear over a dray in the road. The negro glanced up once and dodged, and the next second it made an infinitesimal mincemeat out of a, a framed cooper shop and the coopers swarmed out like bees. Then we said, it was perfectly magnificent and left, because the coopers were starting up the hill to inquire. Still, that mountain, prodigious as it was, was nothing to the pyramid of Cheops. I could conjure up no comparison that would convey to my mind a satisfactory comprehension of the magnitude of a pile of monstrous stones that covered thirteen acres of ground and stretched upward four hundred and eighty tiresome feet. So I gave it up and walked down to the Sphinx. After years of waiting, it was before me at last. The great face was so sad, so earnest, so longing, so patient. There was a dignity not of earth in its mien, and in its countenance a benignity such as never anything human wore. It was stone, but it seemed sentient. If ever image of stone thought, it was thinking. It was looking towards the verge of the landscape, yet looking at nothing, nothing but distance and vacancy. It was looking over and beyond everything of the present and far into the past. It was gazing out over the ocean of time, over lines of century waves, which, further and further receding, closed nearer and nearer together, and blended at last into one unbroken tide, away towards the horizon of remote antiquity. It was thinking of the wars of departed ages, of the empires that had seen created and destroyed, of the nations whose birth it had witnessed, whose progress it had watched, whose annihilation it had noted, of the joy and sorrow, the life and death, the grandeur and decay of five thousand slow revolving years. It was a type of a attribute of man, of a faculty of his heart and brain. It was memory, retrospection, wrought into visible, tangible form. All who knew what pathos there is in memories of days that are accomplished and faces that have vanished, albeit only a trifling score of years gone by, will have some appreciation of the pathos that dwells in those grave eyes that look so steadfastly back upon the things they knew before history was born before tradition had being, things that were and forms that moved in a vague era which even poetry and romance scarce know of, and passed one by one away and left the stony dreamer solitary in the midst of a strange new age and uncomprehended scenes. The Sphinx is grand in its loneliness, it is imposing in its magnitude, it is impressive in the mystery that hangs over its story, 
and there is that in the overshadowing majesty of this eternal figure of stone which its accusing memory of the deeds of all ages which reveals to one something of what he shall feel when he shall stand at last in the awful presence of God. There are some things which, for the credit of America, should be left unsaid, perhaps, but these very things happen sometimes to be the very things which, for the real benefit of Americans, ought to have prominent notice. While we stood looking, a wart or an excrescence of some kind appeared on the jaw of the Sphinx. We heard the familiar clink of a hammer and understood the case at once. One of our well-meaning reptiles, I mean relic hunters, had crawled up there and was trying to break a specimen from the face of this most majestic creation the hand of man has wrought. But the great image contemplated the dead ages as calmly as ever, unconscious of the small insect that was fretting at its jaw. The Egyptian granite that has defied the storms and earthquakes of all time has nothing to fear from the tack hammers of ignorant excursionists, highwaymen like this specimen. He failed in his enterprise. We sent a sheik to arrest him if he had the authority or to warn him if he had not that by the laws of Egypt the crime he was attempting to commit was punishable with imprisonment or the bastinado. Then he desisted and went away. The Sphinx, 125 feet long, 60 feet high, and 102 feet around the head, if I remember rightly, carved out of one solid block of stone harder than any iron, the block must have been as large as the Fifth Avenue Hotel before the usual waste, by the necessities of sculpture, of a fourth or half of the original mass was begun. I only set down these figures as these remarks to suggest the prodigious labor, the carving of it, so elegantly, so symmetrically, so faultlessly, must have cost. The specimen of stone was so hard that figures cut in it remain sharp and unmarred after exposure to the weather for two or three thousand years. Now, did it take a hundred years of patient toil to carve the Sphinx? It seems probable. Something interfered, and we did not visit the Red Sea and walk upon the sands of Arabia. I shall not describe the great mosque of Muhammad Ali, and whose entire inner walls were, are built of polished and glistening alabaster, I shall not tell how the little birds have built their nests in the globes of the great chandeliers that hang in the mosque, and how they fill the whole place with their music, and are not afraid of anybody because their audacity is pardoned, their rights are respected, and nobody is allowed to interfere with them. Even though the mosque be thus domed to go unlighted, I certainly shall not tell the hackneyed story of the massacre of the Mamelukes, because I am glad the lawless rascals were massacred. I do not wish to get up any sympathy in their behalf. I shall not tell how that one solitary Mameluke jumped his horse a hundred feet down from the battlements of the citadel and escaped, because I do not think much of that, I could have done it myself. I shall not tell of the Joseph's well that he dug in the solid rock of the Citadel Hill, and which is still as good as new, nor how the same mules he bought to draw up the water with an endless chain are still at it yet and are getting tired of it too. I shall not tell about Joseph's granaries which he built to store the grain in, what time the Egyptian brokers were selling short, unwitting that there would be no coin in all the land when it should be time for them to deliver. 
I shall not tell anything about the strange, strange city of Cairo, because it is only a repetition, a good deal intensified and exaggerated, of the oriental cities I have already spoken of. I shall not tell of the great caravan which leaves for Mecca every year, for I did not see it, nor of the fashion the people have of prostrating themselves, and so forming a long human pavement to be ridden over by the chief of the expedition on its return, to the end that their salvation may be thus secured, for I did not see that either. I shall not speak of the railway, for it is like any other railway, and I shall only say that the fuel they use for the locomotive is composed of mummies three thousand years old, purchased by the ton or by the graveyard for that purpose. And sometimes one hears the profane engineer call out pettishly, Damn these plebeians, they don't burn worth a cent. Pass out a king. Stated to me for a fact. I only tell it as I got it. I am willing to believe it. I can believe anything. I shall not tell of the groups of mud cones stuck like wasps' nests upon the thousand mounds above high water mark, the length and breadth of Egypt, villages of the lower classes. I shall not speak of the boundless sweep of level plain, green with luxuriant grain, that gladdens the eye as far as it can pierce through the soft, rich atmosphere of Egypt. I shall not speak of the vision of the pyramids, seen at a distance of five and twenty miles, for the picture is too ethereal to be limed by an uninspired pen. I shall not tell of the crowds of dusky women who flock to the cars when they stop the moment at the station to sell us a drink of water or a ruddy, juicy pomegranate. I shall not tell of the motley multitudes and wild costumes that graced a fair we found in full blast at another barbarous station. I shall not tell how we feasted on fresh dates and enjoyed the pleasant landscape all through the flying journey, nor how we thundered into Alexandria at last, swarmed out of the cars, rode towards the ship, left a comrade behind who was to return to Europe, thence home, raised the anchor and turned our bows homeward finally and forever from the long voyage, nor how, as the mellow sun went down upon the oldest land on the earth, Jack and Molt assembled in a solemn state in the smoking room and mourned over the lost comrade the whole night long, and would not be comforted. I shall not speak a word of any of these things, or write a line. They shall be a sealed book. I do not know what a sealed book is, because I have never saw one, but a sealed book is the expression to use in this connection, because it is popular. We were glad to have seen the land which was the mother of civilization, which taught Greece her letters, and through Greece Rome, and through Rome the world, and the land which could have humanized and civilized the hapless children of Israel, but allowed them to depart out of her borders, little better than savages. We were glad to have seen that land which had enlightened religion with future eternal rewards and punishment in it, while even Israel's religion contained no promise of a hereafter. We were glad to have seen that land, which had glass three thousand years before England had it, and could paint upon it as none of us can paint now. The land which knew three thousand years ago well nigh all the medicine and surgery which science has discovered lately, which had all these curious surgical instruments which science has invented recently, which had in high excellence a thousand luxuries and necessities of an advanced civilization, which we have gradually contrived and accumulated in modern times, and claimed as things that were new under the sun, that had paper untold centuries before we dreamt of it, 
and waterfalls before our women thought of them, that had perfect system of common schools so long before we boasted of our achievements in that direction that it seems forever and forever ago, that so embalmed the dead that flesh was made almost immortal, which we cannot do, that built temples which mock at destroying time and smile grimly upon our lauded little prodigies of architecture, that old land that knew all which we know now, perchance and more, and walked in the broad highway of civilization in the gray dawn of creation, ages and ages before we were born, that left the impress of exalted, cultivated mind upon the eternal front of the Sphinx, to confound all scoffers, who, when all her other proofs had passed away, might seek to persuade the world that imperial Egypt, in the days of her high renown, had groped in darkness.